Airclips.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Palmdale, California, USA. My name is Patrick, and I would like to welcome you to another fantastic episode of the Airclips.com Ultimate Cockpit Movies. We are the guests of NASA and DLR today the American and German Aerospace Administrations and of the DSI, the German Institute responsible for operating the uh, SOFIA Airborne Telescope, which is mounted into this beautiful classic Boeing 747SP, an ex-Pan Am aircraft still having a little bit of the Pan Am-like livery and still Christianed Clipper Lindbergh as it was back in the days of Pan Am 2. My name is Oliver Zeile and I'm the lead engineer for the SOFIA telescope and I'm going to give you a small tour of the SOFIA observatory. So um, we're now here in the nose of SOFIA. Uh, as you can see these are still the old first class seats um, from the original SP but on this side we got um, these uh, racks here and this rack is uh, actually the part where we switch on the uh, instrument, uh, switch on the telescope. So this station is for the mission director and the mission director too. This station is for the science instrument and those computers are what actually control the science instrument, take in all the data, store the data. This is now why we're here and why we're doing all this. Um, so basically all the blue part is the telescope that is permanently installed. And right now here, this golden thing here, this is Hawk Plus. Hawk Plus is a fast infrared camera. And the special thing on Hawk Plus is um, Hawk Plus can measure um, the polarization of the incoming infrared light. And it's also strategically placed um, to be a counterbalance to the heavy primary mirror that's on the other side of that bulkhead. Right down here on the other side is, a 800 kilogram, is our 800 kilogram heavy primary mirror. Um, and this also provides a counterbalance to that because the entire telescope is only suspended by one point in the center of that sphere. And when we're observing, everything needs to be in balance. So all the mass here, the mass distribution here, needs to be in balance, needs to be the, needs to be the same than the heavy optics on the other side. To actually point the telescope uh, while the airplane is moving and throwing around in turbulence, we got the so-called fine drive, and that is located basically inside that ball that you can see here. So the fine drive is turning the telescope three degrees up, down, left, right, and also twisting three degrees, so basically in every direction. And this takes care of any tiny aircraft movements um, and, as I said, the, the turbulence. So in flight, you will see this inner part moving, um, but you always have to keep in mind, if you see that moving, it's actually us in the fuselage that gets thrown around by the turbulence. The telescope itself is stable and pointing on the target and not moving at all. So if you get a little sick in turbulence, sit on the telescope because that's the non-moving part and that's basically um, yeah, what, what is stable enough. Now we're on the upper deck, um, behind all the seats. This is where the galley for the first class used to be. Um, and this is uh, the wall of fame for Sofia. So a lot of people who visited Sofia uh, did sign here. This is like one of the um, most um, famous uh, children's science programs in Germany, Sendung mit der Maus. My name is Chris Farina. I'm a flight engineer on Sofia. I started out as a flight engineer in many airlines, different airplanes go, about 1984. Started 747s in 2003 through 2012. Came to NASA 2014, been here eight and a half years. We don't see any, we see any little holes in it. It means it probably had a lightning strike and might have to be inspected. On a normal pre-flight, we make sure that's gone. A, a missing lug nut would be a no-go item, so we check every wheel for that. Cargo door will be closed. There's little windows in the door. So you check that. Come now look at the engine. Come back, look at the motor. General condition. Look at the engine, we look at all the blades, make sure there's nothing damaged. We look at the rim of the motor. 
Make sure there's no loose rivets. The APU is running in the nav light, so on this one you check your nav light. And that's where if you were to dump fuel, it'd come out of that tube there, and there's the vent for it, so you check, make sure that's not obstructed. Nobody's ran into the flap. They have the static wicks on it. It looks good. Check this gauge right here. Make sure they're all in the same. Doors look good. Come back here. The wear pin indicators. You want at least a quarter inch sticking out. It's the right wing gear, it's the right body gear. Check our wear pin indicators. Down there and there. They look good. We look in here. Don't see any leaks, everything looks good. It's our APU emergency shutdown. If there was a fire, you could shut it down from here. Not have to be up in the cockpit. It looks good. Good. Blades look good, cowling looks good. Up here is called the E and E compartment. It's where all the airplane electronics, most of them are housed. It's the first floor of the airplane. There's a ladder, instead of those great big air stairs, that you can send a mechanic down or somebody back up. And see these are spring loaded and you can retract them and pop them up. And once you get up there, there's another door that you get to the main deck of the airplane. So the vast majority of the electronics boxes that you can see are attached there on these racks. And then if you look around the corner, you can look into the lower cargo bay also, which is accessible in flight. Did anybody explain to our guests the, the whole naming thing? Each mission is named. Um, we did that after a while to um, keep track of the science mission versus the actual flight on the aircraft, because if we canceled, then they might try to reschedule that science mission on another night. And uh, so each series just starts with the same letter, and I don't know who picks we're the names. Now, yeah. But we're on Q, which is not all that useful for things. And so last night was Quasimodo, and tonight is Queequeg from Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think everybody is here. Uh, welcome and thank you everyone for being here for flight number 880 uh, named Queequeg. We can see on the graphic here, water vapor uh, along the flight path. Uh, this is 39,000 feet up in the teens and low 20s in some areas. So uh, yeah, on the surface, weather looking really good at these locations, Travis Beal, San Francisco. That's the kind of weather brief we like to hear. Thanks a lot, Derek. Uh, moving on to the start of mission brief. This will be uh, flight number two for Hawk Plus. Welcome back, Hawk. Good to have, good to have that instrument back up and running and, and on board the jet. Timeline, uh, mission brief is underway now. Uh, door closed is gonna be 1920 tonight. If all goes well, we'll be back here at 0458 in the morning. Okay, uh, gonna go down the corridor, flight level 380, gonna be over the ocean for 85% of your uh, flight, then coming back in uh, through the complex and then back in for um, 8 plus 42. Uh, lake 6 is your first B priority. Uh, I've got one late takeoff for you, is due to geometry, it's pretty much you can't catch up. So 06P01. Uh, 13 minutes late. Well, uh, let's have a successful flight. I'll see everybody out there. Thank you. Mission flight deck. Are you going to be ready for a, a pushback or a tow?
Okay, right, uh, parking brake is set. Okay, I see chocks to the right. Thank you. Engines. All right, let's turn two. Turning number two. 25. 30. 35. Turn three. Turning number three. Light off. 25. 30. Flaps. Ground clear on the flaps. Coming down. Okay, uh, ground, you are cleared off. Thanks for your help tonight. Okay, everyone ready to go? Ready. Parking brakes released. I've got 8-8 eight, eight set. We'll update the rest when we get a chance. We are clear right for left turn. Four seven heavy copy clear takeoff runway two five. Warning lights. Checked. 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 Line up checklist complete. Engineers hot okay. mic. Standing up. Releasing brake and set takeoff thrust. Flaps one. Okay, two nine Set eight climb seven. Thrust. Flash. And flaps up. Have to take up check. Good. Good. Los Angeles seven. Good evening. NASA seven four seven. Heavy passive one zero thousand. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the call there, Nash. 747, you're at 1113. That's firm, 747. Nash, 747, we're sending a confirmation to level 190. Up to 190, Nash, 747. Well, it's up to 9 is. I see 190. Uh, we have come out there. 190, Nash, 747, heavy request, uh, level off, final level off of flight level 390. Nash, 747, heavy, uh, 390 is on request.
And now 747 Heavy, request cell call, check Echo Golf Alpha Kilo. And I can see the big message. Cell call, check. Mass M47, good cell call, check, copy 8843 secondary, we'll continue CBDLC. I'm a 1369, call us back, call Tango Center, I'm a That was easy. It was, and I'll take the radio back. Hey, you've got Victor 2, you heard they cleared us to 390. I did. So, step 4, enable, disable, switch to enable. I am in enable. Okay, I'm waiting for data downstairs. I've got data up here. And good data downstairs. CDDS, rotor switch to open. I am in open. I've got a door open light and showing movement. Good motion downstairs. Waiting for full open. CBDS rotor switch to track. I am in track. Good tracking. I will uh, enter the offset and uh, that'll be checklist complete. Thank you. Thank you. So we filed a flight plan that is very close to, but not exactly what they need. So we're good with air traffic control. But then when you hear them say left, one degree left or one degree right, that's Liz tweaking the, uh, the headings of the telescopes just in the right direction. So, so yeah, the line here is what we filed, which is just a bunch of straight segments that approximates a curved path. We're actually going to fly a curve, more of a curved path. And sometimes the winds are a little different than they planned, and so we have, they have to adjust for that. What's your role in the whole mission, please? I'm an instrument scientist. So instrument scientists, we, uh, we are the, the linking piece between the scientists all over the world that propose to observe with Sophia and the telescope and the instruments. And we prepare the observations, execute the observations, okay. and make sure the observations are carried out in the right way. In easy words, what, what are we trying to achieve today with this flight? So we, we are trying to achieve multiple things because we start and land in Palmdale. But one of the big things on today's flight is actually we're observing multiple galaxies. Different kind of galaxies. Basically, galaxies similar than Milky, our Milky Way or different from our Milky Way. And right now, for example, we are looking at a galaxy with a starburst. So an explosion of stars that is forming in that galaxy right now. By right now, we do of course mean millions of years ago since the light has started traveling to us. And we try to understand how and why stars are forming in that galaxy. And today, we investigate the role of magnetic fields how magnetic fields contribute and control the formation of stars in those galaxies. Sophia has distinctive advantages. We start and land every day. So the instruments and the technology that we fly can be repaired and upgraded every day. When you wanna, if you launch a satellite today, the technology that you fly in the satellite is five to 10 years old. Our technology is always up to date and we can repair and we can recheck it. We need liquid helium to cool our instruments to see the infrared variation and we can just refuel. That's not possible with a satellite. We can change our instruments, and our instruments are big and heavy. The instrument right now has a weight of 600 kilograms, or roughly oh. 1,000 pounds. That is a little bit too heavy for a satellite, so we can maximize our instruments, and we change them every couple of weeks. Thank you for everything, for making this possible with your crew here. Oh, we are happy to do it. Thank you. We do like to share Sophia whenever we can, and so this was another opportunity to do that. For, for how long are you with uh, Sophia now? So I've been with Sophia for six years. Six years, okay. And before that you've been flying 777 with the airline, I think you were mentioning. Yes. Yes. Um, so I flew for United Airlines for many years. Uh, I was 
a simulator instructor for them, okay. uh, an academic instructor, curriculum designer, uh, while I was a line pilot. So I flew the 737-300 uh, while I was doing that. Nice. And then I went on to fly the 767 and 757, which was a common type rating, and then the 777. Oh, nice. Mostly on international flights. Is there anything that makes it special for you to fly Sofia? Or would you really consider it more regular flying job as compared to what you've done in the past? So it was actually a combination of my Air Force mission flying and airlines. Um, it was really fun to come back to this type of flying where you were accomplishing a mission. You weren't just taking people from point A to point B. Um, I say the biggest difference is that Everybody's really happy to be on board Sophia. It's not always that way in the airlines. You don't always have a lot of happy people. So everyone's very excited to be here. Uh, we feel like uh, we're making discoveries that will help our understanding of the universe. So that's exciting. And uh, I just always, I always love the stars, always love space. I grew up out in the desert and I just look at the sky every night and wonder. And I was back in the days when Star Trek was new and I watched Star Trek. Fantastic. And just the whole idea of space and what's out there was fascinating to me. So to, to come back to flying Air Force type missions, to being in the desert where I grew up and to looking at the stars just feels like my life came full circle. I was just looking at the screen up oh, yeah. there and I thought it looked like the uh, result chart of a paintball game or something <laughs> like that. So That's right, yeah, yeah. Sometimes we say they look like Rorschach tests. <laughs> so you can see a lot inside them, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, what we're looking at here is actually uh, a series of gas and dust clouds that are forming brand new stars. So what we're looking at is, is the very beginning of the next generation of stars and planets in the Milky Way galaxy. So we like to study uh, stars just before they're born. And what, what we do, uh, Sophia is actually uniquely suitable to do this, is uh, we study the magnetic fields that are surrounding some of these gassy and dusty clouds. Essentially, there are three things that drive star formation. There's gravity that collapses gas and dust together. It pulls all of these gassy structures together and compactifies them to make stars and planets. There's the collisions between all of these gas and dust particles, which try to work against gravity. So it's this constant battle between gravity and kinetic motion. And then the third component is magnetic fields. And we actually don't know a lot about how magnetic fields influence the birth of stars and planets. So what we're interested in doing with Sophia is figuring out the influence of magnetic forces on a lot of these uh, clouds that are giving birth to the next generation of stars. Wow, and, and how how does Sophia help you with that? How, how, I mean, why, why Sophia? Why, I don't know. That's a great question. So uh, as you might tell, we're up in the air right now. Uh, we're at yeah. about 43,000 feet in the pretty stratosphere. High up, yeah. Yeah, pretty high <laughs> up, that's right. Uh, and we go up so high because the type of light that Sophia observes uh, gets absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, which means that this type of light never makes it to the ground. We cannot observe this from the ground. Uh, it's a type of infrared light that uh, these specific for, uh, star forming clouds emit. So in order to even see it in the first place, we must get above most of our atmosphere in either a plane like Sophia or a satellite out in space. But even with all of the satellites in space, Sophia is unique at what it does because of our beautiful instrumentation here. So I started out, I, I didn't go to the Air Force Academy, I went through college, um, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which you've probably never heard of, but uh, nope. uh, reserve officer training program. So I did my Air Force training while going through college. 
and was commissioned as an officer. And then I went to Shepard Air Force Base in Texas um, for my initial Air Force pilot training. It's a Euro-NATO program. Um, there we flew T-37s and T-38s. Um, and then I graduated and I was assigned to fly the F-111. F-111? Um, wow. F-111. From there, I uh, went to the F-117, the stealth fighter. Wow, this, yes, at the, uh, yep. Uh, Those are also retired. Na Nighthawks? Uh, yeah. Is that how they call them? Yeah, the Nighthawk. Yeah, okay. We never really called it that flying it. Okay. We usually just called it the Black Jet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, which it was. Uh, um, in fact, yes. So I flew those. We also flew T-38s as a companion trainer, okay. so I flew that more. Um, from there, I went to the Air Force Test Pilot School in 1998, um, where we flew, over the year, you fly about 25 different types of aircraft. Um, graduated from there and stayed at Edwards and flew F-16s in the nice. F-16 Test Squadron. Um, did that for three years, flew just about every block or model of the F-16, um, then moved back as an instructor at the Test Pilot School. Um, flying F-16s and the Vista, and then I went to Eglin, flew F-16s there, then back to Edwards, and finished out my career flying F-16s. Um, oh, yeah, I did have a stint. I, I went to Afghanistan for six months, flying a Global Express business jet. <laughs> okay, well, that's, with, that's different. With a bunch of electronics in the back. That actually was a good experience because I flew with a pilot and a co-pilot, that was the closest. <laughs> that was the closest to anything like this that I'd ever flown. What an amazing step this yeah. is. Yeah. Um, so then I got hired by NASA to fly F-18s and F-15s, and started doing that. Um, also flew the T-34 with NASA, which is a little propeller-driven plane. Okay. Um, and got checked out in this, which again was the biggest difference in airplanes I'd ever flown. In uh, Palmdale Airport, it's not only okay. the base of NASA. But it's also like skunk works. I mean, where, where the, I think there are, uh, what is that? They do experiments on. They, they build a variety of different planes, yeah. yeah. Well, okay, they're building the X 59. Wow. I happen to have a patch on. Wow. Um, We're going to take a close up of that one for yeah. sure. So, X 59, tell us about that one. Okay, so it is a, we call it a quiet supersonic demonstrator or low boom flight demonstrator. And you're part of the team? I am. You're going to fly this I thing? I will. Oh, man. It is being built right now in Palmdale by the Lockheed Skunk Works. No way. Um, for NASA. Um, we hope to fly this year. So here I'm operating the telescope and these are my cameras. I see in the optical light over here, whereas the science instrument that you've talked to already tonight, I'm sure, sees in the infrared. So when I operate the telescope, that basically means I am making sure that we're pointed exactly where we need to be pointed so that I can set the science instrument up for success. And so when I operate the telescope at the beginning of what is called the science leg, where the plane turns exactly where we need to turn, I will do the initial acquisition. And so what that means is I see a bunch of stars and their names on my screens, and I make sure the names of the stars are lined up exactly with the actual star themselves. What, when this is not moving around all crazy, you can see the way that they're supposed to be. For how many years are you flight engineer now? Well, I've only been with NASA for three years. Um, I flew 747s for the airlines, a company called Evergreen International, for 23 years. Uh, I've got about 15, 16,000 hours as a, on the 747. I uh, started on in the Air Force on C5s. As a, that's wow. my flight, flight engineer experience mostly. Uh, I flew 747s for Las Vegas Sands, the casino in Las Vegas called Sands. They have two 747s. Well, they have one left. But one of them got destroyed in a hurricane. But when I was flying for them, they had two 747s SPs. We flew high rollers all over the world and celebrities, and that, that was pretty interesting also. If you want to talk about how I got started, I would say from my father. Okay. My brother was, my older brother, he's deceased. He was a helicopter pilot. My younger brother's a pilot. My son's a pilot. Really? Yeah, I'm the only one here. I'm the only one who's never, <laughs> who's never been in an airplane by himself. 
Which aircraft is your son flying? Oh, well, he flies Black Hawk for the uh, Army National Guard helicopters. Cool. But he also flies uh, uh, little commuter jets for American Airlines. It's actually called Piedmont out of uh, Philadelphia. Wow, so nice. So CRJ 175s or uh, uh, 145s. I forgot what it is, but just a little little commuter jet. ERJ, I guess. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not even. Sure. I call oh. I call them Barbie jets. <laughs> I <laughs> okay. don't, don't have a flight engineer. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me and my son, we, we, we're, we're always, uh, yeah. uh, you pilots. Yeah. <laughs> nah, it's, fine. it's good. I, nice. I admire everything he's done. He's done real well. Okay, standing by for LFD in the lower limit. URD seal has been verified deflated. We are at our lower limit. Uh, step two, rotor switch if in track to open. I am in open. I see open. Waiting five. You gonna just correct back to course or do you wanna direct to? I'm gonna correct back. Rotor switch to close. I am in closed. I see movement. Good movement. Door light is out, looks like movement stopped. I show fully closed, movement stopped. And uh, CDDS enable, disable, switch to disable. I'm in disable. Going to heading? Short range now. Short range now. And approach. So we get your lights. Already on. Sure. Okay, I got him. So that should be medium. I'm taking it off autopilot. See it? Flaps 20. Speed's good, flaps good, 20. Gear down, speed breaks your arms. Yeah, it's speed on course on flaps. Approaching up. minimums. Only in sight landing. Minimums. 100. 50. 40. 30. 20. 10. Extended. Yeah, about 110 knots. Coming on the brakes, I'll go down to the next uh Auto brakes are off. Yeah, they didn't really seem like they were doing much. You got 60 knots. Your steering's armed. Thank you. All right, you got 15. There's 10. Yeah, stopped with four knots of ground speed. Yeah, parking brake is set. Pressure is normal. 
All right. Thank you guys very much. Good flight. Airclips.com